Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. T. E. Lawrence. Thomas Edward Lawrence was a British archaeologist, military officer, diplomat, and writer. He was renowned for his liaison role during the Sinai and Palestine campaign and the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire during the First World War. The breadth and variety of his activities and associations, and his ability to describe them vividly in writing, earned him international fame as Lawrence of Arabia, a title used for the 1962 film based on his wartime activities. Lawrence was born out of wedlock in Tremadog, Wales, in August 1888 to Thomas Chapman, an Anglo-Irish nobleman from County Westmeath, and Sarah Junner, a Scottish governess who was herself illegitimate. Chapman had left his wife and first family in Ireland to live with Junner, and they called themselves Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence. In 1896, the Lawrences moved to Oxford, where Lawrence attended the high school, and in 1907-1910 studied history at Jesus College, Oxford. Between 1910 and 1914 he worked as an archaeologist, chiefly at Karch Emish, in what is now Syria. Soon after the outbreak of war he volunteered for the British Army and was stationed in Egypt. In 1916, he was sent to Arabia on an intelligence mission and quickly became involved with the Arab Revolt, serving, along with other British officers, as a liaison to the Arab forces. Working closely with Emir Faisal, a leader of the revolt, he participated in and sometimes led military activities against the Ottoman armed forces culminating in the capture of Damascus in October 1918. After the war, Lawrence joined the Foreign Office, working with both the British government and with Faisal. In 1922, he retreated from public life and spent the years until 1935 serving as an enlisted man, mostly in the Royal Air Force, with a brief stint in the Army. During this time, he wrote, and published his best-known work, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, an autobiographical account of his participation in the Arab Revolt. He also translated books into English and wrote The Mint, which was published posthumously, and detailed his time in the Royal Air Force working as an ordinary aircraftman. He corresponded extensively and was friendly with well-known artists, writers, and politicians. For the Royal Air Force, he participated in the development of rescue motorboats. Lawrence's public image resulted in part from the sensationalized reporting of the Arab Revolt by American journalist Lowell Thomas, as well as from Seven Pillars of Wisdom. In 1935, Lawrence was fatally injured in a motorcycle accident in Dorset. Early Life Thomas Edward Lawrence was born on 16 August 1888 in Tremadog, Carnarvonshire, Wales in a house named Gorfusfa, now known as Snowdon Lodge. His Anglo-Irish father Thomas Chapman had left his wife Edith after he fell in love and had a son with Sarah Junner, a young Scotswoman who had been engaged as governess to his daughters. Sarah was the daughter of Elizabeth Jonner and John Lawrence, who worked as a ship's carpenter, and was a son of the household in which Elizabeth had been a servant. She was dismissed four months before Sarah was born. Sarah and Thomas did not marry, but lived together under the name Lawrence. In 1914, Sir Thomas inherited the Chapman Baronetcy based at Killua Castle the ancestral family home in County Westmeath, Ireland, but he and Sarah continued to live in England. They had five sons. Thomas Edward was the second eldest. From Wales the family moved to Cacubri, Galloway in southwestern Scotland, then dinnered in Brittany, then to Jersey. In 1894-96, the family lived at Langley Lodge, set in private woods between the eastern borders of the New Forest and Southampton Water in Hampshire.
The residence was isolated, and young, Ned, Lawrence had many opportunities for outdoor activities and waterfront visits. Victorian Edwardian Britain was a very conservative society, where the majority of people were God-fearing Christians with the corollary the premarital and extramarital sex were considered deeply shameful, and those born illegitimate were born disgraced. Despite having in many ways a happy childhood, and youth, Lawrence was always something of an outsider, a bastard who could never hope to achieve the same level of social acceptance and success that those born legitimate could expect, and who was virtually unmarriageable as no girl from a respectable family would ever marry a bastard. In the summer of 1896, the Lawrences moved to Two Polstead Road in Oxford, where they lived until 1921. Lawrence attended the city of Oxford High School for boys from 1896 until 1907, where one of the four houses was later named Lawrence, Indiana, his honor. The school closed in 1966. Lawrence and one of his brothers became commissioned officers in the Church Lads Brigade at St. Aldith's Church. Lawrence claimed that he ran away from home circa 1905 and served for a few weeks as a boy soldier with the Royal Garrison Artillery at St. Moore's Castle in Cornwall, from which he was brought out. No evidence of this appears in army records, antiquities and archaeology. At the age of 15, Lawrence and his school friend Cyril Beeson cycled around Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, visited almost every village's parish church, studied their monuments and antiquities, and made rubbings of their monumental brasses. Lawrence and Beeson monitored building sites in Oxford and presented their finds to the Ashmolean Museum. The Ashmolean's annual report for 1906 said that the two teenage boys by incessant watchfulness secured everything of antiquarian value which has been found. In the summers of 1906 and 1907, Lawrence and Beeson toured France by bicycle, collecting photographs, drawings, and measurements of medieval castles. In August 1907 Lawrence wrote home, The Chanyons and the Lumbal people complimented me on my wonderful French, I have been asked twice since I arrived what part of France I came from. From 1907 to 1910, Lawrence studied history at Jesus College, Oxford. In the summer of 1909, he set out alone on a three-month walking tour of Crusader castles in Ottoman Syria, during which he traveled on foot. Lawrence graduated with first-class honors after submitting a thesis titled The Influence of the Crusades on European Military Architecture to the End of the Twelfth Century, based on his field research. With Beeson in France, notably in Charles, and his solo research in the Middle East, Lawrence was fascinated by the Middle Ages with his brother Arnold writing in 1937 that for him, Medieval researches were a dream way of escape from bourgeois England. In 1910 Lawrence was offered the opportunity to become a practicing archaeologist in the Middle East, at Karch Emish, in the expedition that D. G. Hogarth was setting up on behalf of the British Museum. Hogarth arranged a senior demiship a form of scholarship for Lawrence at Magdalen College, Oxford, in order to fund Lawrence's work at £100 a year. In December 1910, he sailed for Beirut and on his arrival went to J. Bale, where he studied Arabic. He then went to work on the excavations at Karchemish, near Jerobolus in northern Syria, where he worked under Hogarth. Ah. Campbell Thompson of the British Museum, and Leonard Woolley, until 1914. He later stated that everything which he had accomplished he owed to Hogarth. While excavating at Karch Emish, Lawrence met Gertrude Bell. In 1912 Lawrence worked briefly with Flinders Petrie, 
at KAFRMI in Egypt. Military intelligence In January 1914, Woolley and Lawrence were co-opted by the British military as an archaeological smokescreen for a British military survey of the Negev Desert. They were funded by the Palestine Exploration Fund to search for an area referred to in the Bible as the Wilderness of Zin. Along the way, they made an archaeological survey of the Negev Desert. The Negev was strategically important as, in the event of war, any Ottoman army attacking Egypt would have to cross it. Woolley and Lawrence subsequently published a report of the expedition's archaeological findings. But a more important result was updated mapping of the area, with special attention to features of military relevance such as water sources. Lawrence also visited Akaba and Petra. Following the outbreak of hostilities in August 1914, Lawrence did not immediately enlist in the British Army. On the advice of S.F. Newcomb, he held back until October, when he was commissioned on the general list and posted to the intelligence staff in Cairo before the end of the year. His extensive travel in the area and knowledge of Arabic made him an obvious choice. Lawrence arrived in Cairo to take up service in the Arab Bureau on 15 December 1914. The Bureau's chief was Gilbert Clayton who reported to Egyptian High Commissioner Henry McMahon. The situation during 1915 was complex. Within the Arabic-speaking Ottoman territories, there was a growing Arab nationalist movement, including many Arabs serving in the Ottoman armed forces. They were in contact with Sharif Hussein, Emir of Mecca, who was negotiating with the British offering to lead an Arab uprising against the Ottomans. In exchange, he wanted a British guarantee of an independent Arab state including the Hejaz, Syria, and Mesopotamia. Such an uprising would have been very helpful to Britain in its war against the Ottomans, in particular greatly lessening the threat against the Suez Canal. However, there was resistance from French diplomats, who insisted that Syria's future was as a French colony not an independent Arab state. There were also strong objections from the government of India which although nominally part of the British government, acted independently. Its vision was of Mesopotamia under British control serving as a granary for India. Furthermore, it wanted to hold on to its Arabian outpost in Aden. At the Arab Bureau, Lawrence supervised the preparation of maps, produced a daily bulletin for the British generals operating in the theatre, and interviewed prisoners. He was an advocate of a British landing at Alexandretta, which never came to pass. He was also a consistent advocate of an independent Arab Syria. In October 1915, the situation came to a crisis, as Sharif Hussein demanded an immediate commitment from Britain, with the threat that if this were denied, he would throw his weight behind the Ottomans. This would create a credible pan-Islamic message that could have been very dangerous for Britain, which was under stress, at the moment in severe difficulties in the Gallipoli campaign. The British replied with a letter from High Commissioner McMahon that was generally agreeable, while reserving commitments concerning the Mediterranean coastline and Holy Land. In the spring of 1916, Lawrence was dispatched to Mesopotamia, to assist in relieving the siege of Kut by some combination of starting an Arab uprising and bribing Ottoman officials. This mission produced no useful result. Meanwhile, unbeknown to the British officials in Cairo, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was being negotiated in London, which awarded a large proportion of Syria to France. Further, it implied that if the Arabs were to have any sort of state in Syria, they would have to conquer its four great cities, Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo. It is unclear at what point Lawrence became aware of the treaty's contents. Arab Revolt 
The revolt began in June 1916 and after a few initial successes bogged down. With a real risk the Ottoman forces would advance along the coast of the Red Sea and recapture Mecca. On 16 October 1916, Lawrence was sent to the Hejaz on an intelligence-gathering mission led by Ronald Storrs. He visited and interviewed three of Sharif Hussein's sons, Ali, Abdullah, and Faisal. He concluded that Faisal was the best candidate to lead the Arab revolt. In November, it was decided to assign S.F. Newcomb to lead a permanent British liaison to Faisal's staff. As Newcomb had not yet arrived in the area and the matter was of some urgency, Lawrence was sent in his place. In late December 1916, Faisal and Lawrence worked out a plan for repositioning the Arab forces in a way that prevented the Ottoman forces around Medina from threatening Arab positions and put the railway from Syria under threat. When Newcomb arrived and Lawrence was preparing to leave Arabia, Faisal intervened urgently, asking that Lawrence's assignment become permanent. Lawrence remained attached to Faisal's forces until the fall of Damascus in 1918. Lawrence's most important contributions to the Arab revolt were in the area of strategy and liaison with British armed forces. But he also participated personally in several military engagements. In June 1917, on the way to Aqaba, Lawrence made a 300-mile personal journey northward, visiting Ras Baalbek, the outskirts of Damascus, and Azraq. He met Arab nationalists, counseling them to avoid revolt until the arrival of Faisal's forces, and attacked a bridge to create the impression of guerrilla activity. His findings were regarded by the British as extremely valuable, and there was serious consideration of awarding him a Victoria Cross in the end. He was made Companion of the Order of the Bath and promoted to Major. Lawrence travelled regularly between British HQ and Faisal, coordinating military action. But, by early 1918, Faisal's chief British liaison was Colonel Pierce Charles Joyce, and Lawrence's time was chiefly devoted to raiding and intelligence gathering. By the summer of 1918, the Turks were offering a substantial reward for Lawrence's capture initially £5,000 and eventually £20,000. One officer wrote in his notes, Though a price of £15,000 has been put on his head by the Turks, no Arab has, as yet, attempted to betray him. The Sharif of Mecca has given him the status of one of his sons, and he is just the finely tempered steel that supports the whole structure of our influence in Arabia. He is a very inspiring gentleman adventurer. Capture of Akaba In 1917, Lawrence successfully proposed a joint action with the Arab Irregulars and forces including Aouda Abu Tay against the strategically located but lightly defended town of Akaba on the Red Sea, while Akaba could have been captured by an attack from the sea. The narrow defiles leading inland through the mountains were strongly defended, and would have been very difficult to assault. The expedition was led by the well-respected Sharif Nazir of Medina. Lawrence carefully avoided informing his British superiors about the details of the planned inland attack, due to concern that it would be blocked as contrary to French interests. The expedition departed from WEJH on 9 May. Akaba fell to the Arab forces on 6 July, after a surprise overland attack, taking the Turkish defences from behind. After Akaba, General Sir Edmund Allenby, the new commander-in-chief of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, agreed to Lawrence's strategy for the revolt. Stating after the war, after the fall of Akaba, Lawrence held a powerful position as an advisor to Faisal and a person who had Allenby's confidence. Dara
in both Seven Pillars and a 1919 letter to a military colleague. Lawrence describes an episode on 20 November 1917 while reconnoitering Dera in disguise. When he was captured by the Ottoman military, heavily beaten, and sexually abused by the local bay and his guardsmen, the precise nature of the sexual contact is not specified. There have been allegations that the episode was an invention of Lawrence's, and that he exaggerated the severity of the injuries he claimed to have suffered. There is no independent testimony, but the multiple consistent reports in the absence of evidence for outright invention in Lawrence's works make the account believable to his biographers. At least three of Lawrence's biographers, namely Malcolm Brown, John E. Mack, and Jeremy Wilson have argued that this episode had strong psychological effects on Lawrence, which may explain some of his unconventional behavior in later life. Lawrence ended the Seven Pillars of Wisdom with the statement, I lost all my innocence that night in Dara. Fall of Damascus Lawrence was involved in the build-up to the capture of Damascus in the final weeks of the war. He was not present at the city's formal surrender, much to his disappointment and contrary to instructions which he had issued, having arrived several hours after the city had fallen. Lawrence entered Damascus around 9 a.m. on 1 October 1918, but was the third arrival of the day. The first was the 10th Australian Light Horse Brigade, led by Major ACN, Harry, Alden, who formally accepted the surrender of the city from acting Governor Emir said. Lawrence was instrumental in establishing a provisional Arab government under Faisal in Newley liberated Damascus, which he had envisioned as the capital of an Arab state. Faisal's rule as king, however, came to an abrupt end in 1920, after the Battle of May Saloon, when the French forces of General Goro entered Damascus under the command of General Mariano Goybe, destroying Lawrence's dream of an independent Arabia. During the closing years of the war, Lawrence sought to convince his superiors in the British government that Arab independence was in their interests, with mixed success. The secret Sykes-Picot agreement between France and Britain contradicted the promises of independence that he had made to the Arabs, and frustrated his work. In 1918, he cooperated with war correspondent Lowell Thomas for a short period. During this time, Thomas and his cameraman Harry Chase shot a great deal of film and many photographs, which Thomas used in a highly lucrative slideshow presentation that toured the world after the war, which Thomas used in a highly lucrative slideshow presentation that toured the world after the war. Post-war years Lawrence returned to the United Kingdom a full colonel. Immediately after the war, he worked for the Foreign Office, attending the Paris Peace Conference between January and May as a member of Faisal's delegation. On 17 May 1919, the Handley Page typo carrying Lawrence on a flight to Egypt crashed at the airport of Roma Sentosel. The pilot and co-pilot were killed. Lawrence survived with a broken shoulder blade and two broken ribs. During his brief hospitalization, he was visited by the King of Italy Victor Emmanuel III. In August 1919, Lowell Thomas launched a colorful photo show in London entitled With Allenby in Palestine, which included a lecture, dancing, and music. With Allenby in Palestine engaged in what was later deemed Orientalism. The depiction of the Orient, as the Westerners called the Middle East up until World War II, as strange, exotic, mysterious, bizarre, sensuous, and violent. Initially, Lawrence played only a supporting role in the show as the main focus was on Allenby's campaigns. But, 
When Thomas realized that it was the photos of Lawrence dressed as a Bedouin that had captured the public's imagination, he had Lawrence photographed again in London in Arab dress. With the new photos, Thomas relaunched his show under the new title with Allenby in Palestine and Lawrence, Indiana, Arabia in early 1920, which proved to be extremely popular. The new title which elevated Lawrence from a supporting role to a co-star so to speak of the Near Eastern campaign reflected the changed emphasis. Thomas's shows made the previously obscure Lawrence into a household name. Lawrence served for much of 1921 as an advisor to Winston Churchill at the Colonial Office. Lawrence hated bureaucratic work, writing on 21 May 1921 to Robert Graves. I wish I hadn't gone out there, the Arabs are like a page I have turned over. And sequels are rotten things. I'm locked up here, office every day and much of it. Lawrence had a sinister reputation in France, both during his lifetime and even today being seen as an implacable enemy of France. The man who was supposedly constantly stirring up the Syrians to revolt against French rule throughout the 1920s. The French historian Maurice Laris wrote that the real reason for France's problems in Syria was that the Syrians did not want to be ruled by France, and the French needed a scapegoat to blame for their difficulties in ruling the country. Laris wrote that far from being a Francophobe, as he is usually depicted in France, Lawrence was really a Francophile, Laris wrote. But we should note that a man rarely devotes much of his time and effort to the study of a language and of the literature of a people he hates, unless this is in order to work for its destruction, which was clearly not Lawrence's case. Had Lawrence really disliked the French, would he, even for financial reasons, have translated French novels into English? The quality of his translation of Le Gigantesque reveals not only his conscientiousness as an artist, but also a knowledge of French that can scarcely have derived from unfriendly feelings. Laris concluded that the popular thesis in France that Lawrence had virulent anti-French prejudices, is not supported by the facts. In August 1922, Lawrence enlisted in the Royal Air Force as an aircraftman, under the name John Hume Ross. At the RAF recruiting centre in Covent Garden, London, he was interviewed by recruiting officer F. O. W. E. Johns, later known as the author of the Big Old series of novels. Johns rejected Lawrence's application as he correctly believed that Ross was a false name. Lawrence admitted that this was so and that the documents he had provided were false. He left, but returned some time later with an RAF messenger, who carried a written order that Johns must accept Lawrence. However, Lawrence was forced out of the RAF in February 1923 after his identity was exposed. He changed his name to T. E. Shaw and joined the Royal Tank Corps later that year. He was unhappy there and repeatedly petitioned to rejoin the RAF, which finally readmitted him in August 1925. A fresh burst of publicity after the publication of Revolt in the Desert resulted in his assignment to a remote base in British India in late 1926 where he remained until the end of 1928. At that time, he was forced to return to Britain after rumours began to circulate that he was involved in espionage activities. He purchased several small plots of land in Chingford, built a hut and swimming pool there, and visited frequently. The hut was removed in 1930, when the Chingford Urban District Council acquired the land. The hut was given to the City of London Corporation, which re-erected it in the grounds of the Warren Loughton. Where it remains today, Lawrence's tenure of the Chingford land has now been commemorated by a plaque fixed on the sighting obelisk on Pearl Hill. Lawrence continued serving in the RAF based at RAF Mountbatten near Plymouth, RAF Calshot. 
near Southampton, and Bridlington, East Riding of Yorkshire, specializing in high-speed boats and professing happiness, and it was with considerable regret that he left the service. At the end of his enlistment in March 1935, in the interwar period, the RAF's marine craft section began to have built for it air sea rescue launchers capable of higher speeds and greater capacity. The arrival of high-speed craft into the MCS was driven in part by Lawrence. He had previously witnessed the drowning of the crew of a seaplane when the seaplane tender sent to their rescue was too slow in arriving. Working with Hubert Scott Payne, the founder of the British Power Boat Company, the Longson 200 seaplane tender MK1 was introduced into service. These boats had a range of 140 miles when cruising at 24 knots and could achieve a top speed of 29 knots. Lawrence was a keen motorcyclist, and owned eight rough superior motorcycles at different times. His last SS100 is privately owned, but has been on loan to the National Motor Museum, Bewley, and the Imperial War Museum in London. Among the books that Lawrence is known to have carried with him on his military campaigns is Thomas Mallory's La Mort d'Arthur, Accounts of the 1934 discovery of the Winchester manuscript of the Mort include a report that, after reading about the discovery in the Times, Lawrence followed Mallory scholar Eugene Vineva from Manchester to Winchester by motorcycle. Death At the age of 46, two months after leaving military service, Lawrence was fatally injured in an accident on his Bruff Superior SS100 motorcycle in Dorset, close to his cottage, Clouds Hill, near Wareham. A dip in the road obstructed his view of two boys on their bicycles, he swerved to avoid them, lost control, and was thrown over the handlebars. He died six days later on 19 May 1935. The location is marked by a small memorial at the side of the road. One of the doctors attending him was neurosurgeon Hugh Cairns, who consequently began a long study of the unnecessary loss of life by motorcycle dispatch riders through head injuries. His research led to the use of crash helmets by both military and civilian motorcyclists. The Morton Estate, which borders Bovington Camp, was owned by Lawrence's cousins, the Frampton family. Lawrence had rented, and later bought Clouds Hill from the Framptons. He had been a frequent visitor to their home, Oakers Wood House, and had for years corresponded with Louisa Frampton. Lawrence's mother arranged, with the Framptons, to have him buried in their family plot in the separate burial ground of St. Nicholas Church. Morton. His coffin was transported on the Frampton Estate Spear. Mourners included Winston and Clementine Churchill, E. M. Forster, Lady Astor and Lawrence's youngest brother Arnold. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.